Good morning, everyone. I just was uh, realizing one of life's little ironies and contradictions of UC Berkeley. I, I prepare the notes uh, for this class in the Free Speech Movement Cafe, and then I walk back over here on the way to Warren Hall, and I, I stop in at the Pat Brown Cafe, because you may not realize this, you may be too young, but Pat Brown was the governor of California who ordered the police to come in and arrest the students who were in the Free Speech Movement Cafe. So you can't say that Berkeley is not even-handed. Uh, I apologize for, uh, is Jean here? Okay. I apologize for not being to my office hour yesterday. Forgot my own office hour. I think that's pretty lame. But uh, actually, I had quite a few appointments, and the rest of them had all gotten switched around, so I got confused. And I'm a professor anyway. I get to do things like that. So I will be holding an extra one today. I will be there from 12 to 1 in my, in my office in 101 Stevens. Everything else will be by appointment. Normally, it will be 12 to 1 on Tuesday in uh, 101 Stevens will be my office hour. Uh, oh, so sorry if I sent you all the way over to that drastic waiting line at Copy Central only to discover that the reader wasn't ready yesterday afternoon. Anyway, it's ready now. Here it is. The best $27.60 that you'll ever spend right here. Um, as far as getting into the course is concerned, from the look of things, I was assuming that we had plenty of room last time, but when I added up the number of people who were here or had their roommates check them off or whatever happened, uh, it looks like we do have still quite a bit of uh, a waiting list that uh, is more than I can at the moment add to the course. So as mentioned, I'm going to try to get a bigger room, but that is probably going to be very difficult at this time. So as far as I'm concerned, anyone who wishes to can audit the class. That's uh, fine with me, and I'm going to try very hard to get all the PAX majors into the list. But if you, uh, we'll have to take another look at this at the end of next week and see, see where things stand. Um, I didn't even mention it last time. It's usually the first thing that I talk about in this class is, this is partly tongue in cheek, the lab. PAX 94, the meditation class, is like a practicum or a lab for PAX 164 series. Um, I actually did try to get it renumbered as 164L. At one point, I wanted the Committee on Courses to admit that meditation was a laboratory for nonviolence. They wouldn't let me do that. They said it has to be a wet lab, and you have to deal with actual physical chemicals you know, that you can pour into a test tube. I said, Kundalini won't do? They said, I didn't actually say that, but <laughs> you can see what I'm driving at. What I'm driving at is that uh, that's a terrific combination. You're taking meditation in the morning and nonviolence later on, you'll find that you, they support one another very, very well. I can point you to certain people who are doing that, who can give you a testimonial for the price of a latte or whatever it is they, that they drink. However, the fact of the matter is, and the reason that I didn't mention it last time, is that class also is up to here. We have people sitting meditating on the floor. And, but that's at 8 o'clock in the morning, so I may be able to get a bigger room for that one. And then if you'd like to try that again, you don't have to take it for credit. Uh, I always tell the students, uh, illumination or one unit, whichever comes first. Um, and we're just waiting for the day that somebody says, never mind the unit, I've gotten illumined. Uh, but that's, that's another resource for us, and, and I'm going to be bringing in various ones as we go along. But uh, you've got plenty to deal with right now. But if you're interested, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is a group that we're going to be talking about, one of the categories of things that we're going to be learning on the level of accumulating information is organizations, who's out there doing what, and the Fellowship of Reconciliation is one of the oldest peace organizations in the world. Two years ago, I had the uh, emotional experience of standing on the railway platform in Cologne, Germany, which is where the, a German and a Brit shook hands at the outbreak of World War I and said, whatever happens, we will never let this war come between us as friends. 
and they started the International Fellowship of Reconciliation in 1914. It's still going on, and right now they're having a book sale. So <laughs> just go on to FORUSA if you feel that you don't have enough nonviolence books already. And I would actually recommend that you just go and take a look at the title, see what's out there, um, whether you feel like buying more books right now or not. It'll give you a sense of what's available. Hi, good. We need you right up here. For <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what we'd like to do now, I didn't quite finish elaborating on the ways in which I am going to claim that nonviolence is not just a way of greasing the wheels for getting to a smoother through a smoother transition into the next world order, whatever that is, whether it's, uh, what was the name of that novel, The Lord of the Flies, where you know, we're all just sort of s stranded on some desolate island somewhere clawing out of their existence, or whether we've actually built a new and more sustainable world order. To, in order to get through that transition with a minimum amount of destruction, uh, nonviolence is essential. As Gandhi said, you can have a violent revolution if you want to, but violent revolution will bring violent Swaraj. Swaraj means independence. It also means what kind of regime you have. And I thought of that in uh, 1976. It's one of the great advantages of being an older person. I was around for the, cent the bicentennial of the USA, and the then president, I forget his name, but he was a screen actor, had been the governor of California at one time. He was reviewing the troops, so the troops were acting out the Revolutionary War stuff, you know, with their stupid costumes and stuff. Sorry, I shouldn't be putting in all of these editorial comments, but the fact is he was reviewing the troops between two inches of bulletproof glass. Because, in other words, we did, in that we did create a violent Swaraj here. Because our story is that the way we created this country is through a violent revolution, through a war. Actually, it turns out. Are you comfortable there, Yelena? Because. Okay, great. And there, there's one chair, so going begging here. Um, there are historians now who are arguing that neither the Revolutionary War nor the Civil War had to get fought, that we would have gotten independence <laughs> sooner without it, and we would have been able to rescue the Union without the Civil War. But that doesn't affect our story, our cultural story that we tell ourselves is a story of what has been called redemptive violence. And because of that dedication to violence, as this problem-solving mechanism, we have a violent Swaraj. Um, so if, 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 if nonviolence could provide nothing else, it will provide a mechanism for getting to a new world order, whatever that new world order is going to be, with a minimum of destruction. And that means that it will be a less destructive world order, according to the <coughs> principles of uh, nonviolence. But I'm going to be arguing more than that. I'm slowly filling in this picture that it, if you look at nonviolence in the full, deep sense, the way Gandhi looked at it, it's much more than just a transition. It's the definition of the goal. It's really everything on every level. Everything you need to build a sustainable world is basically there in Gandhi's worldview. Um, you might think, of, well, I've had Sid put our list on the board here from last time of the basic characteristics that we came up with for nonviolent, uh, for nonviolence, and we'll be referring back to that as we do go into our early um, case studies. I wanted to forewarn you that uh, the good news and the bad news about today's talk. The good news is I have some really exciting ideas that I want to share with you. The bad news is that I just got them in the FSM Cafe, so I'm not sure they're terribly well organized. I know what you're thinking, you know, Nagler, you've been teaching this course for longer than I'm alive. Haven't you got it organized yet? I don't know. Maybe that's somehow part of the message. You know, maybe when I really get this course organized, I'll retire and then it'll be, it'll be all over. But bear with me. We have some really, I think, insightful ways of coming at this thing, and we'll have to put it all together ourselves. But <coughs> what I wanted to try sharing with you now is that if you're taking controlling processes, 
as I know some of you are, you're looking at what are the things that shape the world that we live in, what are the forces that control and shape human behavior. And I would suggest that we look at them as, as a three-layer cake for right now. Structure meaning governance, you know, what uh, you look in the Constitution and it mandates certain things. But also you look at certain uh, institutions in our governance here, for example, and you'll discover to your shock that the Constitution didn't say anything about them. There isn't a word in the Constitution about the two-party system. But we have a two-party system which nobody has succeeded in getting out from under or, or disrupting. So I'm including all of that. And I remember John Burton, who is a great legislator from California. California, of course, is gifted with a handful of really great legislators. California and one in Illinois <laughs> and a couple of others, and that's about it. Another illegal editorial comment <laughs> on the side. But John Burton, who was really a great legislator from California, a great mentor to a lot of progressive people, he said he thinks every time he drives from San Francisco to Sacramento, he passes these, f these flats, you know, uh, polder lot, I guess, wetlands, wetlands. And every time he passes those wetlands, they re it reminds him of government. It is everywhere. It's spread out all over everything. It's going to tell you what you can do, what you can't do. But it's very shallow. There are things that create what kind of government you're going to have. So underneath the structure of things, we have to look at the culture. What, what are the stories that we tell ourselves about the norms of human behavior and the structure of reality. And out of these norms, we'll develop laws and documents of various kinds to control behavior. And then underneath all of that is what I was quoting to you last time from St. Augustine, his mantra, if you will, that keeps coming up in the city of God, duos quitates, duo faciunt amores. In fact, I'm going to put that on the board. I think that's really cool. It actually puts it this way. My parents are looking down from heaven now and smiling because they paid a lot of money for me to get a classical education and <laughs> I'm finally using it. So let's treasure this moment. <laughs> and this means if you translate it literally, two cities are created by two loves, quote unquote. And uh, translating that into modern idiom, there are two drives and they create two very different world orders. And in fact, one of these uh, places where Augustine quotes this, he says, uh, and I translate, there are two world orders created by two drives. The love of God makes Jerusalem and the love of the world creates Babylon. Those, of course, are Old Testament symbolisms, symbolism for the ideal world order, sustainable world of peace and harmony versus Versus what? Versus South Central LA, <laughs> you know, certain parts of Chicago <laughs> and uh, other places in the world indeed. So let each person ask himself what he loves and he will discover what kind of world he is building. Okay. Um, so the dominant concept of how we should fix the world is to Oh, sorry, I interrupted myself. Underneath structure there is culture and underneath culture there is the amor or the drive that's bringing it into existence. And the dominant idea of how to fix things is to create the right kind of structure that will control what's coming out of the culture. You know, that's where we have a building uh, on campus with very fancy graffiti all over it called Barrows Hall. And in there they have a, a subject called political science, another one called sociology. Well, sociology is a little more into the cultural area, but 
political science is all about creating the right kind of structure to make sense out of the cultural material that we've got to work with. And what I'm proposing is that what we're trying to come to now is a, not only a different set of values and a different structure, but a different way of going about the whole process. And that is, instead of creating a structure that'll control what's coming out of the culture, we're talking about how to build a new culture out of which new structures will automatically emerge. And a new sense of how important structures are will automatically emerge, which is that they're a lot less important than the culture and the stories that go into it. Um, so one of the big changes that we're trying to bring about is this uh, a new world order with a new structure and a new relationship between the various parts. And if you remember from last semester, there is a sense in which in Gandhi's time, the structure of his movement was hierarchical, right? It had one person at the top. That was a Mahatma or a great soul. And while his campaigns were in full swing, he did not hesitate to say, I am your general. I expect you to obey my orders. The only difference being, if you remember, that if you don't like what I'm doing, you fire me, which is not what you can do with a dictator. If you could, we wouldn't have to be sitting here having this course. So it looks hierarchical. You have a Mahatma. Underneath that, you have a kind of inner circle People who live with him practically, they're very, very close to him. People like Vinoba Bhave and uh, Sardar Patel, some of these people we looked at last time. Very close to that, you have the inmates of the ashram. These are people who are living in his community, following his lifestyle. It's the last uh, detail, sort of. Say sort of because there's a story about somebody who wanted to join Gandhi came to his ashram and so he had a long discussion with Gandhi and Gandhi was telling him, you know, what you do, what time you get up, here's when we have prayer, here's, here's when you spin. And they started telling him what, what he had to eat and the fellow was sort of appalled because you know, Gandhi, as it turns out, had no sense of taste, he had no sense of taste, no sense of smell. So he just ate exactly what he felt was healthiest for him. So the fellow comes reeling and staggering out of this hut. He said, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice my life, but I can't eat that stuff. And he bumped into Patel or somebody who said, no, look, here, come on. This is what you're going to eat. And he said, but, but Gandhiji told me I have to eat this. And he said, look, in matters of food, you will obey me. In all other matters, you obey the Mahatma. So with some adjustments for the fallibility of human flesh, these are people who have given up everything, are living with him, and they're following his disciplines permanently. This is a way of life for them, or for as long as they're going to be there anyway. Then underneath that, you have a fairly good cadre of trained satyagrahis. Satyagrahi being people <coughs> who practice satyagraha. Now, and they may not live in the ashram. Some of them are very, very wealthy people who lived in palaces, in fact. But uh, they've been in campaigns with him, and they're on, they're on call. And then underneath that, as soon as the, I'm thinking, for example, of a big campaign like the Salt March, the Salt Campaign, the Salt Satyagraha, when it gets started, all of these people are pulled into position, and here you just have recruits by the hundreds of millions, literally out of whom there will be a few who will become satyagrahis and some of them maybe will percolate up and become part of the inner circle and so forth. So this is a refresher for the A people. But you remember that in a way, what he did was very hierarchical. What he created was very hierarchical. But I think there are three senses in which it was not hierarchical despite the fact that it looks that way on the blackboard. One is the one that I've already mentioned, that it's, he's, it's a provisional hierarchy. You know, he, he said, if you don't want me here, just let me know. I'm happy to go back to my ashram 
and just you know do a lot of meditation and spinning and whatever. Uh, the second thing is that this hierarchy was only really pulled into place during emergencies. And there's a qualitative difference almost in nonviolence, as in anything else, between emergency situations and ordinary situations. Uh, and it's a fact that anthropologists have discovered that in emergencies, societies spontaneously become more hierarchical. They have to because you have to become efficient and you have to become coherent. If we have an outside threat, <laughs> let's say <coughs> there's another institution down the peninsula which fancies itself also a high quality institution of higher learning, let's just say, and they were to uh, you know, assault us in some way and you couldn't send out you know, ten different people with ten different stories about who we are. You couldn't have a different behavior every fifteen minutes. We'd have to pull this place together, muster out the ROTC, whatever they call it these days, uh, military affairs, we're going to defend ourselves. And what uh, I'm thinking now of uh, scholar Rene Girard, whom I draw a lot on his work, he pulled together some anthropological studies that showed that even if you take the same species, like you take the same species of <coughs> chimpanzee, let's say, and you look at the, how they live in two different environments. If you look at how they live in a secure, comfortable environment, like up in the forest canopy where there's not a lot of trouble from leopards, they have a rather egalitarian <coughs> kind of society considering that they're chimpanzees. They don't get totally egalitarian. Some things have to be controlled by threat, but they're reasonably egalitarian. Take these same animals living on the edge of the forest in the savanna where they can be spotted by any passing lion and you'll find that there's a head chimp and underneath him there's a cadre of uh, subordinate chimps down onto the women, the f well, the female chimps and the babies. Very hierarchical because of the outside pressure. So people who like to have a hierarchical <coughs> order in their culture will sometimes actually uh, stoop to creating a sense of outside pressure, like saying, you know, <coughs> we're about to be invaded by terrorists, something like that, so, you know, we're going to tear up the Constitution now. This just hypothetically <laughs> saying this as, as an example. Um, okay. Do you want some paper? Sorry. Or okay. Fine. So that's the second thing. This is a provisional hierarchy in the sense that you can fire the top command anytime you want to. It's provisional in the sense that it's only brought in in an emergency. And some of you will remember that in real emergencies, nonviolence can look very, very strange. You can almost not be able to tell the difference just looking at it from a behavioral level from violence. Do you remember that, you guys who were talking about? Amy, what am I thinking of here? Uh, yeah. you have, like, the person that That's right. Yeah. In the case where somebody, uh, there's not even a drawer in this classroom, so I can't do what I did last year, but in case somebody runs in here with a gun, uh, obviously deranged, uh, and, uh, you know, for one second I think, you know, this is a good way to get all the waitlist people but into the course, but no, then I have. Uh, saner thoughts uh, and I want to do something to protect all of you and it just so happens that I have a loaded 9 millimeter on me which is a little bit out of character. Uh, <laughs> but believe it or not, this is the point, the, believe it or not, the nonviolent thing to do would be to shoot that person because I have no other means to protect you in this emergency situation. But if I'm going to really do it in a nonviolent way, it's going to be a little bit different in terms of things that are not visible in terms of attitude. Okay? So let's see. What would be the first thing, Joanna, would be different? I hope you guys don't mind that I'm getting maximum amount of mileage out of you people. Well, okay, I wouldn't have a gun in the first place. So the whole story is absurd, I admit that. But in its own terms, Suppose it did actually happen 
And I'm still claiming that, in a sense, this is a nonviolent act. Uh, what would that claim be based on, John? Okay, okay. Let's say I I run yes I run through all the alternatives in about eight tenths of a second, and I realize I don't have any. Yeah, that'd be one thing. Yeah, Joanna. Right. Yes. Now that what Joanna said may sound a little bit silly in a way. I wouldn't want to hurt that person. Here I am shooting them. Uh, but it's not that I want to hurt them, it's that I want to protect you. And at the moment, I have no other way to do that. Okay, so in nonviolence, in principle nonviolence, intention is everything. In fact, you remember we go over the etymology of the Sanskrit word for nonviolence, ahimsa, it seems to literally mean the lack of desire to harm. Okay. And one other thing is equally important. I'd like to. Alex, do you? you know, I'm putting you guys on the spot, I realize. You don't remember the other? Amy? Well, in a way, like, <coughs> you have the idea that what you're doing is what you said as well. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, this is a dangerous argument, but I'm convincing myself that, you know, you'd be much better off being shot by a nonviolence professor than, than killing all these people and having to live with that for the rest of your life. That's true. But there's, there's one that's. Uh, if anything, even more important, and that is the follow-up. I wouldn't derive from this the lesson that every professor should be provided with a loaded 9 millimeter in every classroom because this worked. Okay, this is our work versus work. It worked, but it, dis it did very bad work. So instead, I'm going to dedicate myself to changing society so this kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. You know, tithe part of my time so that we have fewer lunatics in the world, if that can possibly be derived. So, okay, yeah, Zoe? I was wondering what is the law? See, this is a good question. Nagler's law, again, partly tongue-in-cheek, nonviolence plus violence equals violence. You can see why mm -hmm. I, I'm not a math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> The point that we were talking about a little bit last time, that if you have basically a nonviolent campaign but a little bit of violence creeps into it, that little bit can be very, very destructive. And it's not just because of the way it'll be perceived by the public, but it does something to completely break up the dynamic. So tragic example of this was the 1999 anti, uh, anti WTO demonstrations in Seattle where you had something like 50,000 people who were extraordinarily well disciplined and well organized and completely nonviolent, uh, as complete as can be, going on there for four, five, six days. And you had this small group of people called the Black Bloc, otherwise known as the famous Eugene Anarchists, who threw some bricks through some windows. And the press zeroes in on this, and the entire story of what that <coughs> movement was, was completely changed. But I still maintain it's not just the perception and the distortions of the media, but something in the very nature of it. So Zoe's question is very legitimate. How are we going to square NV plus V equals V, famous Nagler's Law, with uh, the madman with the sword analogy, which is what this kind of ep uh, structure is called, this episode? You can't. That's, I, that's the point I'm making is that there comes a point where, in an emergency, almost everything is stripped away. All the laws that you want to apply earlier on <coughs> when you've got the time and you can do the organizing, you can't do them. And what you're just reduced to one simple thing, not to hate your opponent. It really comes down to that, and I'm really glad you asked me that, Zoe. You can go through all of this horrible stuff, and somehow, if you do it without hating that person or persons, you've rescued a nonviolent uh, core in your own behavior. And that nonviolent core, we believe, will eventually lead to doing good work on the social order. It will change things for the better. <coughs> Though at the moment, we don't know how to tell you what all ways that will play out. 
that's, that's mysterious. So this was part of my point that the hierarchical nature of Gandhi's campaigns was an artifact of, of several things, one of them being that these are emergencies. And in fact, from the time he gets back to India, or at least from the time he makes his first move in 1916 till the time that you get independence 31 years later, you're basically in a state of perpetual emergency, right? Because of the violence that happened 200 years ago, and now you're trying to get rid of it. And the third, so the third thing is, the third thing that differentiates the hierarchical nature, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I was just wondering if you consider now for the first time doing emergency. Uh, this is a very good question. Are we in an emergency now? Well, you know, I think I'm going to give you a very good academic answer to that. Yes and no. <laughs> I think that we can be working on various levels. And some of those will be for the long term, and some of those will be for the short term. And I think that we have to be working on all of them. Uh, you know, actually, uh, the, the, whole, the whole class is about answering that question. I think we should come back to it at the end of the semester and see what we're going to come up with. Yeah. Hold, that, hold on to that one. I think there are some things which, let me put it this way, there are some things which would require late stage, fairly drastic emergency actions if we say to ourselves, this has got to be stopped. I don't care what it takes. So if we were, if we were to decide that we're not going to let another 20,000 troops go into Iraq, or if we were to decide that the country's got to stop practicing torture, things like that, those things are in emergency status. But at the same time, we could be slowly educating the public so that they'll never c happen again. <coughs> you know, so we use emergency measures to get rid of them right now, and we use longer-term measures to make sure that they don't creep back. This, this is one of the key principles we're going to be seeing in all of the movements that we're looking at, that they can do a beautiful job in getting rid of a horrible dictatorship and one or two years later, it's the same old, same old. You're back in the same poverty, the same cycles of repression, because you didn't do the long-term work to build in the deep changes that get down into culture and actually start mobilizing a different kind of drive from the person. So I, I think we should be working across the board on almost all of these things. But that's a great question. Okay, now if I remember, I was uh, about to say the third criterion, which tells you that don't be fooled, the hierarchical structure of a campaign like the Salt March is not the nature of nonviolent world order. So we have the fact that uh, you can fire the top leadership, you can, it's an emergency, so everything is likely to look weird. And finally, it really is mobilizing a different drive. Gandhi is deeply committed to the well-being of the British people, and he's absolutely convinced that the best thing he can do for them is get them the hell out of there. I shouldn't even put it that way. Get them out of there as rulers. <coughs> have them stay on as friends. By the way, how many of you saw Attenborough's movie, Gandhi? Okay. I would strongly recommend it. If for no other reason I keep referring to it, it's just part of my consciousness now. It'll be It'll be easier to figure out what I'm talking about. But if you remember the scene where he says, it's the, right after the Jolly and Wallabog massacre, they're having a hearing, and one of the officials says to him, well, well, old boy, you don't just expect us to get up and leave, do you? And he says, that is exactly what I expect you to do. Only I expect you to go out as friends, not as enemies. So with apologies for the ethnic accents and all the rest of it, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's move on. So what I'm driving at here is one of the things that we're struggling with now, we being the progressive movement, is how do we replace the structures of domination with more viable, more democratic structures? And one of the things that we're realizing, and don't ask me who we are, it's just, you know, like a handful of friends and sort of the sprinkling of a movement out there. One of the problems is we don't know each other. 
I don't know if you're familiar with a book called Cultural Creatives by Anderson and uh, Sherry Anderson and Ray, Ray and Anderson. This book looks at what uh, Americans really think and what they want politically and came to the conclusion, which I could have told him, but they didn't ask me, that this left, right, red, blue business is nonsense. It's not what people really are after. There's a whole new political compass and there's a segment of the population. This is d very good sociologists. They did this study about 10 years ago. There are 35 million Americans who want things to be entirely different in what we might call a progressive direction. And the only reason, now 35 million is more than enough to get an election to come out right so dramatically that you couldn't cheat it, which is what we need to do. <laughs> There's more than enough people. Five million would probably do it at this time until they get better voting machines. But the reason that these people don't pull together and do something is that they don't know one another. They don't know that there are others, that you sit in your house thinking, uh, you put your little uh, you know, let's win in Iraq slogan on the front lawn and you hide behind that and you hope that your neighbors don't realize that you don't really want to have a war making country anymore. Meanwhile, your neighbor is thinking the same thing, putting the same silly stuff on his lawn. So one of our great disadvantages is this whole progressive change, the emerging paradigm and all of that, all the ingredients are there but it hasn't been pulled together yet because we don't know who we are. But wh whoever we are, one of the things we're struggling with is instead of, as I say, instead of building a different structure to control a culture, somehow change the culture so that it will create a different structure. And this means that a different kind of organizing can prevail or take over. And at this point, I'd like to tell you a story that came in on the internet last year after Katrina. I tried to just look up this story, but unfortunately Katrina turns out to be a girl's name as well as the name of a hurricane. So I was getting thousands of Katrinas and I wasn't <laughs> getting down to this story. But I remember it well enough. What, uh, w what we all learned in that disaster was the utter incompetence of the central regime, the federal government, to manage it, right? Because it was based on the wrong principle. They had a f FEMA is there to take care of emergencies. It's called the Federal Emergency Management Association. But what it really is is uh, the Higher Bush's Friends Association. It's based on cronyism, not on competence. In fact, I'd like to take this slogan and offer it to Barack Obama and anybody who's listening out there. Competence, not cronyism. Right? Maybe it won't possibly make as much a difference as I think, but I thought it was kind of neat at 4 o'clock this morning. Uh, anyway, so we, this is public knowledge now. We all have this lesson. The, the central d government failed. What we don't know is that there were other organizing systems that did not fail. And there was a story by a doctor who was in a hospital in New Orleans. It was completely flooded out. A students have heard this once already. So there's no power and uh, you have patients in very bad shape. They've got to be evacuated. A convoy of army trucks comes slogging up through the water to evacuate these patients. But how are you going to get them out? The next thing you knew, the doctors, the nurses, the ambulatory patients, the volunteers, everybody had pulled themselves into a structure, if you will, and everybody knew exactly what to do and they did it and they got those people out of there in no time. So, you know, you had big strong people picking up patients with IV tubes coming out of them and walking down seven flights of stairs in 110 degree heat, getting them into the trucks. The point that fascinated this young doctor was nobody was in charge. You know, nobody gave orders, there was no loudspeaker. He didn't get on and say, okay, you know, get up to Ward 6. Everything happened automatically. So what we're trying to develop is a way that the self-organizing structures can emerge from the culture and replace the suppressive domination by central 
uh, hierarchical mechanisms. And then you'll find that this is exactly what Gandhi was actually doing, especially in slightly less acute emergencies. He always said, I have never led the people. What I do is I listen carefully to them, and I hear what they want, and I help them get it. So he thought of himself as a facilitator, as some kind of spontaneous self-organizing process. Um, but let's not kid ourselves. There are spontaneous self-organizing processes that are extremely deadly. We studied these last semester when we were talking about scapegoating, where groups of people not only can but will, left to their own devices, pull themselves into some kind of tense structure where troublemakers are going to be identified and expelled. And this happens even at the pre-human level. There are monkeys that do this. And so this, this is gets us back to what Augustine was talking about with the two drives. We need a way to capture, to facilitate the positive love, if you will, and not the negative one. There's incidentally a modern version of this uh, mantra of his, which I'm sure many of you have heard. Again, it goes, it goes around the internet. It's a Native American grandfather says to his grandson, son, I feel that there are two wolves fighting inside of me, and one of them is a very strong, loving, calm, peaceful animal, and the other is a savage, out-of-control beast. And the grandson says, for heaven's sake, well, of course, he wouldn't say that in Native American. He says, gosh, grandfather, <laughs> which one is going to win? And what does he say? You've heard this? The one that I feed. So realistically, what a culture does is it feeds the positive and starves the negative amor that's in each individual. And this brings us to a very clear understanding of the situation that we're in right now. We have created a culture which, not to put too fine a point on it, I have to say I think this is the worst culture I've ever encountered. And this is you know, from somebody who is studied the ancient world, medieval world, modern world. I spent a lot of time looking at cultures. I didn't know that that's what I was interested in, but I was. I was asking myself, how did ancient Greece work? And all the rest of it. And I, can, I have never seen a culture as destructive as ours. It's like 95% getting the negative drive up on through to the higher ranking structures such that you have a president. Now, I'm not saying that he wasn't genuinely moved. We have a picture of him weeping because of a fallen Marine. You know, that's one fallen Marine. We've got something somewhere between 40 and 100,000 fallen Iraqis, and, and he didn't weep. There, the, the entire structure has become a structure for organized violence. I had a colleague who once objected very strongly to this and said, you can't say that the military is organized violence. I said, okay, it's disorganized violence. <laughs> but this is what we're getting at, and this is what I'm saying, that nonviolence is really effective at all of these levels. It's trying to come up with new ways of organization. <laughs> and as we look at some of the movements that have taken place recently and are taking place now, we're going to try to understand how they organize themselves. And it's kind of hard because they often do it in ways that we're not familiar with and ways that are not documented. Okay. So I just want to say one really negative thing about our culture. Uh, because I, I think it is important for us to recognize this and to know what we're really up against. This is, a, this is probably the most depressing thing I'm going to have to share with you all semester. So let's try and get through with it very quickly and move on to the other stuff. But I was reading a, a friend of mine, I guess, who is a therapist, had a young woman, a teenager, I believe, who was a patient, who had uh, you know, hurt herself. And she had cut the word empty on her forearm. 
And it really seemed, to, it, this struck me because I was remembering that scene in a film that we saw last semester where the civil rights workers went into an area where they knew they might be very seriously attacked. They were very badly beaten. And all over the country you saw pictures of them with the you know, tooth, teeth coming out, the black eye and everything. And they said, we made our bodies into living witnesses for the law, for the suffering that we had to take on. Well, it, this struck me very much, the story of this young lady, because it seemed to me that what she unconsciously had done was internalize the basic message of our culture. Yes, please, you know, let me just get through this and we'll get back up to the rescue part. But we are exposed to something on the order of 3,000 commercial messages a day. And there's a subtext uh, in every one of those messages which is telling you, you are empty. You need something. If you even glimpsed for one moment what there is inside of you, you wouldn't have to buy my product or much of anything else for that matter. So what's happened is it's not like we're, we're bad people or anything. We're just people. You know, everybody's got two wolves going on in there somewhere. But because of technology, we've given an enormous amount of power to groups th that are organized for exploitive purposes. And as I started talking about this a little bit last time, the struggle again just comes back down to which purpose is society going to be organized for? Is it for life or is it for profit, basically? Uh, David Corton, who was uh, originally an economist, ha has been writing about these issues wrote a book called When Corporations Rule the World, and he wrote another book called after that called The Post-Corporate World, and then he his most recent book is called The Great Turning. And if you think about corporations, I mean, there's nothing wrong with corporations per se. I run one. You know, it has a staff of two people, <laughs> six volunteers, and <laughs> most of whom are in this room. <laughs> and it's not that corporations themselves are bad, but something happens to them when they go beyond human scale and they lose sight of everything except their own materialistic parameters for well-being, right? But bottom line kind of corporations. And along the way, two very drastic things happen that intercept the good drive in people. One of them is you deprive people of their responsibility, right? If, if I were to invest in a corporation, which is a little bit more likely than coming to class with a loaded 9 millimeter in my pocket, but not totally unlikely. If I invest in a corporation, I am not legally responsible for anything that that corporation does. In fact, in uh, the German word for corporation is Gesellschaft mit begrenzten Heften, which means uh, an, or thanks Amy, it's an organization mm -hmm. with limited liabilities, right? So I can't go down to, let's say, Nicaragua, because I have Nicaragua on the brain these days, and uh, you know, kill some poor person, but I can invest in a, in a company that's creating a structure which structurally makes it impossible for that person to live and not be held accountable. So it takes responsibility out of me and puts it in an artificial structure which does not exist. I mean, if we all decide tomorrow that Microsoft does not exist and nobody goes to work at that company, it will fail to exist. Some might say that <laughs> this would actually be an advantage. That's, that's you, know, you can go back to using WordPerfect and OpenOffice and all of those programs, but whatever. Uh, it's an artificial thing, whereas a person is not. That's why nonviolence keeps trying to put its focus back on the person, on the individual. So it takes responsibility away from the person and re it gives an artificial sense of rights to an abstract entity that doesn't really exist. And it's interesting that this hap crept into the structure in a very backdoor way. You know, the, the Supreme Court did not decide 
that corporations have rights. Uh, Congress did not mandate it. it. One circuit judge somewhere in some ruling in the early part of the 20th century, I mean this was so 20th century, decided that corporations should be treated as though they had rights. And that has become globalism where you can march into a country and say, you don't own your land, you don't own your water, we get to make you sick and you can't stop us because if you interfere with us making a profit, we will sue you. So the, the basic mistake there which we're going to be struggling to correct through nonviolent methods is that you take the responsibility away from the person, the humanity in effect away from the person and pretend that it's in the large corporate entity. Um, so one of my favorite – let's see where we got – okay, we're about in the right place. One of my favorite slogans for what we're trying to do is not to put a different kind of people in power, but to put a different kind of power in people. Or to put it in a slightly different way, to mobilize the positive power that people have, support them institutionally, with the stories that we tell ourselves in our culture and have that become the structure. Yeah? How did we actually accomplish that? Because we are in the Okay. At a personal level, yeah, we're just that form of society that comes in and we're going to be doing this work. Okay. But how do we manage this on a larger scale? Right. Well, this is a – I knew this question was going to come up. I've actually got some things to say about it here. The question is, okay, we can do this individually. We can decide, uh, you know, I'm going to bike to work and uh, I'm going to try to not hate people and stuff like that, whether they deserve it or not. But how does this get built into the culture and become part of the structure? Okay, I'm going to say that the reason that we have such hesitation about that is in itself part of the lie of the prevailing culture, which tells us that you as an individual are powerless. But having said that, I'm going to give you uh, a more honest answer and say, I don't know. But we are starting to study this to some degree. Since that book in 1962, called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which popularized the concept of paradigm and paradigm shift. People have been studying how these big changes happen, and I guess this book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point. It's interesting that he's a, a business professional and that book is read in business schools. It should be read in revolutionary cells, although you know, Al-Qaeda should be reading this book. Uh, but the tipping point uh, discovery is that in any group there are key individuals whose decisions automatically communicate themselves to large numbers of other people. The, the one classic example will maybe make this vivid. Uh, if you grew up in this country, you went to high school in the U.S. of A, you know all about Paul Revere. You know that the British were attacking in, I guess, Boston Harbor or someplace in New England. And they had this signal set up and they were going to alert the Minutemen so they would come out and shoot the British and then we'd have America. And uh, so Paul Revere got on his horse in the middle of the night and he's riding north somewhere out of Boston, knocking on people's doors and saying, the Redcoats are coming, the Redcoats are coming. And people throw open their window and they look down and say, oh my God, it's Paul Revere, the breadcoats are coming. They grab their guns and they get ready to create the United States of America. So that's the history that we all learn in school. But what Malcolm Gladwell discovered was that uh, Paul Revere was one of about three or four people who were sent out in different directions. And so these other people, they would come riding up to your house and knock on the door and say, the redcoats are coming. And you look out the window and say, huh, it's Nagler. And they go back to sleep. <laughs> so uh, it, at least the situation is not as hopeless as it looks even without the internet because if we can get this story embedded in key individuals and they can interact with one another in a creative way, there is absolutely no reason why this could not radiate out through the entire culture very quickly.
Yeah, John. Yes, I would call that an example of person power. It's one kind of power that specific individuals have. Yeah. Yes, Elana. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Like yeah. 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 Yep, that's all perfectly true what Yelena is saying, that there are – people have a tendency in them to want to obey hierarchical directives. That's the Milgram experiments that we've all learned about, very demoralizing. But I would say, hey, look, you know, this was a hierarchy and a lot of people were in it because they wanted to obey Gandhiji. And, but it was a hierarchy that led them to democracy and freedom if they would actually – you know, go through everything that he was proposing, which wasn't totally the case. But there's, in other words, there are revolutions and revolutions, and there are hierarchies and hierarchies. You know, there are hierarchies which are going to tend to get more and more dense and not let anybody out until finally you reach what's called the paradox of repression, where they lean on people a little bit too hard and they have to fight back. And there are hierarchies which are kind of spontaneously self-organizing and spontaneously disorganizing when they're no longer needed. After all it's said and done, if everybody liked obedience and following hierarchies, they wouldn't come to Berkeley, right? <laughs> you, you wouldn't be here if that was the kind of world that you were looking at. So I guess part of what I'm saying is something very unpopular which is that I don't think we can totally dispense with hierarchies. I, I'm not a complete anarchist in that regard, which is a disgrace because Emma Goldman is actually a relative of mine by marriage, so I'm disgracing the whole family when I say this. But <laughs> I'm not totally an anarchist, but I'm saying that there is a place for positive hierarchies. And if we had some positive hierarchies going on, then that very tendency which people have in them that you're referring to could be used in such a way that we could create truly democratic structures, truly viable cultures, and truly healthy, empowered, diverse individuals. Okay. And I also have to say what we're going to be discovering very shortly in this course, while it's true that people have that very disconcerting tendency to fall in line with hierarchies that they also have a tendency to something inside them that says, I want to get the hell out of here. And when you show them a way out, it's amazing how quickly you can precipitate a revolution. So some of them will go right back into the next available hierarchy, which is why you need a completely nonviolent revolution. My, uh, my mentor when I was doing classics and comparative literature was uh, Alain Renoir and his father was Jean Renoir, the, the great filmmaker. And so Alain, when he was a young boy, was hanging out on the set of the film uh, Grand Illusion, uh, Grand Illusions. And uh, so this was a World War I movie. And a cast of thousands, and you, whether you were a German soldier or a French soldier, whether you got a captain's uniform or a private's uniform, depended on how big you were and what time you got to the desk when they were handing out uniforms. In other words, totally arbitrary, whether you're a private, lieutenant, corporal, what have you. Okay, but within one week, Alain noticed this is why I love the guy, this is why he was my mentor. Within one week, he noticed that during the lunch breaks, on the set, all the officers, the people wearing officers' uniform, they would congregate over on one side and all of the enlisted men would congregate over on another side. And if one of the enlisted men made the mistake of walking past the officers, they would hand him some money and say, um, apporte-moi un carafe de rouge. <laughs> you know, give him a 10 franc note and tell him to go buy wine for him and stuff like that. And they would do it. It took one week 
of wearing uniforms for people to spread themselves out on hierarchies. So I agree that we have this tendency, but A, I don't think it's the only tendency we have. After all, Alain Renoir was not wearing one of those uniforms. Uh, and B, it, it does, it's not necessarily fatal because we can create ones that are organic, that draw upon innate structures that are more like biological self-organizing systems. This is what we're trying to, to get at today in this field and that will not impede human development will not impede – the individual will not have to sacrifice anything of importance to him or herself for the good of the whole. So that's where Gandhi derived this model of oceanic circles. I should have mentioned that actually. If this is what it looked like when you had an emergency, when you did not have an emergency, you had this series of concentric circles was his idea where he said the individual serves the family, the family serves the village, the village serves the district, the district serves the state, the state serves the nation, and the nation serves the world. So you have a structure, if you will, that's larger than the individual but does not impose p power on the individual. It's not a domination structure. Now at one point he went even further and said you have an individual willing to perish for the family, a family willing to perish for the village, and so on and so forth if it, if it gets that far. Okay. So other questions before I move on? Okay, good because we're running out of time anyway. Um, I want to start thinking now a little bit about uh, insurrections and the first example that we're going to look at in a couple of moments was a set of insurrectionary <coughs> movements. But don't get confused. We're going to go back and do some uh, history of radical pacifism in the U.S. before we get <coughs> to study insurrectionary movements per se, which will be a week from now. So don't let this confuse you. But if you take this list of the characteristics that you need to have a nonviolent episode or campaign or what have you. And you ask yourself a slightly different situation. What if you're in a situation of oppression and you need to fight back against it and you need to do it now because there's, a, there's an opportunity and if you don't take this opportunity, more lives will be lost and the thing will close down again. And you haven't, you haven't got a Mahatma around for one thing. You know, you put out a, an ad, um, you post an ad on, the, on your blog and say, is there a Mahatma out there? We need to have a nonviolent revolution now. Nobody answers you or rather hundreds of phonies will <laughs> answer you. You know perfectly well that's what would happen. So you don't have that kind of leadership. You have ordinary people to deal with. They have the problem in them that Yelena was talking about. What are you going to do? I think there are three basic ingredients with which you can launch a successful insurrection that can capture enough nonviolent energy that it will work, quote unquote, or stand a good chance of work, quote unquote, and will also do good work in the sense that it will bring the history of nonviolence forward. And those three characteristics are, and again, this is not, uh, th these, are, these are in hyperspace. These are not in bronze somewhere on a rock, <laughs> somewhere on the campus. So if you think maybe there should be four of them or they should be different ones, we can certainly discuss this. But at the moment, th I think there are only three ingredients that you need. You need a just cause. You need enough courage to break out of the spell that's created by the system. And this is very much a tipping point thing. And uh, next week, sorry, week after next, we'll be seeing films where this is exactly what happened in five regimes. You have people suffering or a lot of oppression. One or two tipping point individuals step forward and say, hell, I don't care what you do to me. I'm not afraid. And suddenly the whole thing starts to break up. <coughs> the whole domination system starts to break up. And then you need only one other thing, and that's number four that to some degree you have a sense that it's not about hating people, it's about fixing the problem. And you may even have a sense, not fooling yourself, you really believe 
that it's better for the oppressors to stop oppressing you. You know, one of my favorite uh, hadith or traditional stories that's told about uh, the prophet is that he said to his followers one day, you must help everyone. And one of them said, you don't mean that. You know, we help brothers, but we do not help oppressors, right? And the prophet, may peace be upon him, said, no, I really meant it. You must help everyone. And the person says, how do I help an oppressor? And the epic answer was, by preventing him from oppressing. So if you can reach at least some part of that attitude uh, in an honest way, then I think you have the basic ingredients for a successful nonviolent insurrection. The rest is strategy. And that is actually a critical element because people often do this, but they have no idea what to do with it. Um, this might be an example. It's a, it's a very important episode anyway. It's in my book, uh, the, the Rosenstrasse Prison Demonstration, 1943 in Berlin. Uh, Jews who